This episode of the Autism Dead podcast is brought to you by my friends at Tracto. Tracto is a free app that's all about empowering parents to better understand and meet the unique needs of their kids with autism, ADHD, or anxiety. Tracto does this by easily allowing for the collaborative tracking of behaviors over time. Parents can invite teachers or anyone else they want to help document behavioral changes. Being able to document behaviors in real time prevents having to pull from memory later on, making it a more accurate and reliable source of information. Tracking things like sleep patterns, medication-related behavioral changes, behaviors in the classroom, or anything else that parents of these amazing kiddos need to keep an eye on can be challenging. Simply put, Tracto makes it easy. All tracking and collaboration functions of this app are completely free of charge. They also offer affordable online courses taught by leading experts if you're interested in learning some new parenting skills, for example. They're short videos that will teach you new parenting approaches and help you gain more insight into your child. You can find more information about Tracto by visiting tracto.app. That's T-R-A-C-T-O dot app. You can also check out the Google Play or the Apple App Store and use the code the Autism Dad at checkout to save 40% off of your online course order. Welcome to the Autism Dad podcast. I'm Rob Gorski. Thank you for taking the time to tune. I really do appreciate that. If you haven't already done so, please be sure to check out my brand new website, listen.theautismdad.com, where you'll find everything you need related to this podcast. You can leave comments on episodes, you can stream the episodes, you can share them, you can subscribe, you can rate them, you can do all kinds of stuff. You can apply to be a guest or look at sponsorship opportunities or, or whatever, all in one place. I'm very, very proud of it. Listen.theautismdad.com. Okay, that's enough of that. <laughs> uh, we're going to do a parent to parent episode today. I love doing these. They're my favorite thing to uh, to bring you guys. And my guest today is Jacqueline Carrillo. She's a single mom raising twin teenage autistic daughters and she's going to talk about her life and what her daughters are like and some of the challenges that they face and the things that they've overcome and whatever it's unscripted i have no idea how the conversation is going to go but i love these episodes because it's so important that we remember that every family's experience is different every autistic person is different and this is a great way to highlight that so jacqueline thank you very much for taking the time to come on the show could you take a minute and just tell us a little bit about yourself Sure. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me and for this opportunity. Um, I, my name is Jacqueline Carrillo. I am 39 years old. I am a mom of twin girls. They are both autistic. They are 13. They'll be 14 in December. And uh, right it's now, rough age. I, uh, yes, it is a, a very difficult age. And I'm very lucky that I have an understanding employer. It gives me the flexibility that I need for these difficult moments that I have with them, which is virtually almost every night. So you had made the comment that you have a very understanding employer that allows for the flexibility in your schedule. How important is that to you? I mean, I know that sounds like a dumb question. Like I realize it's important. I guess I'm asking that question in that way because maybe other employers out there can realize the impact that they're having by making accommodations for parents who are dealing with you know, challenging things at home. Yes, it's very important. And the reason being is that, you know, last minute, anything can happen, you know, with autism and special needs, sometimes things happen out of our control. And there's no way we can actually, like a raging fire, we have to wait till it actually just goes out. That's how it is sometimes. And if I can have, and it's very important because then it gives me a sense of security. Like I don't have that anxiety, like, oh my God, I'm late again. My boss is going to fire me, you know? Um, And currently right now I work for Amazon. And so they do offer me that flexibility. They do provide a certain amount of hours to each of their employees to cover for those kind of things. And so they've reached out to me and I've explained my situation that I have to a beautiful teenage daughters that are special needs and autistic and they're Thelma and Louise and they give me more for my bunny. They always give me a hard time <laughs> and they just look at me and smile and be like, okay, you know, as long as I have those things that are covered. And they actually have on their, um, on their screens, you know, to remind anybody that is a caregiver to make sure you are taking care of yourself. And, you know, they do offer resources if you're not able to get in touch with anything for living or, you know, assistance with with food or or services. They have mental health services as well. So Amazon does a really great job about that. My plant, uh, LGA5. That's very cool. It would be nice if more employers were sensitive to that, I think. Well, I know that would be a good thing. I don't know why I said I think. Um, what? Okay. So, so your girls are, they're 13 going on 14. I have a 14 yes. year old. No, I, oh, I have a 13. He's going, he'll be 14 on the 26th actually. Oh wow. This month. Yeah. This month. I keep forgetting. I keep forgetting because everybody's referring to him as 14 cause it's so close. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. He's not 14 until the 26th. So yeah, he'll be 14 on the 26th. When are, when are your girls 
They will be 14 in December. Okay. The 23rd, right before Christmas. Oh, that's a, that's a busy week. Yes, it is. It's very uh, exciting for us. We get that, you know, we're the special parents that do Christmas and birthday. All in the sure same they, week. they don't get you. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, you don't have any of those. I don't have any birthdays in December, so that's never had to deal with that. Oh, it's, it's fun. It's double the fun, as they say, being that they're twins and all, so. When your girls were younger, like what was it that made you suspect um, that there, there may be autism involved? And, and then how did that whole process sort of work for you? So when the concern of autism came about, it was because of my mom. My mom was very adamant that the girls were not hitting their milestones. She was like, Jacqueline, they're supposed to be talking by now. I said, Ma, all the kids are different. Don't compare them to the other kids and their twins. So I heard they have their own languages and things like that. And then there was also, you know, because we are Spanish. And they said it's because maybe that we're speaking Spanish and English at home, the delay. And so she kept nagging me. And she's like, what do you have to lose? And I said, you know what? You're right. I have nothing to lose. So I went ahead and did it. I went ahead and did it. And I'm very thankful that she was very persistent because that's when the girls were diagnosed. Um, they were like two and a half. What was that process like? Uh, you're in Jersey, right? Yes, I'm currently in New Jersey, but at the time when the girls were born and diagnosed, they were, we were living in Michigan. They were born in Detroit, Michigan. Oh, okay. What was, was, what was the process like? Because a lot of parents that I talked to, in fact, I just got an email from a mom the other day who, who was just, who was really struggling because they're on this endless wait list to get diagnosed and their child is two years old and the pediatrician thinks that the kid's autistic and, but they have to go through that whole process. It, was it frustrating for you or was it pretty like smooth sailing kind of? I'm going to say smooth sailing and, I, and I'm lucky for that because I hear a lot of stories and I'm sorry, I'm just really taken back that you're actually telling me there's a waiting list to be diagnosed. Oh yeah. I, lucky for us, there wasn't a list. We had contacted someone from the county through the state and they came over, um, a therapist and they did various like things like, you know, the puzzle pieces and, you know, how to put the blocks and things like that. And so that's, uh, so it was a pretty simple process for them to come out and do the assessment. And when the assessment was done, it was simple. They set them up at early childhood mm-hmm. school, the early childhood. It's like early intervention. And we have exactly. Early intervention, early childhood schools mm-hmm. that they had. Um, and it was an autism containment class. So all the other little kids that are there, boys and girls were also autistic, but were in a regular school setting. And then that's when, you know, we started to do the therapies and they were doing OT therapy, ABA therapy, and um, that's how everything started. What were some of the challenges that you faced when they were younger? Well, it was definitely the communication part because they did a lot of pointing and things like that. And they didn't even, even though they're sisters, twin sisters, they didn't even recognize each other or look at each other. So like no eye contact, even with each other, you know, it's almost like they look, they completely like ignored each other. Now, forget it. They're like Thelma and Louise. So, <laughs> <laughs> and that's as far as some of the difficulties. And besides the fact that, um, you know, they're not fully expressed themselves. You know, that's a difficulty, let alone them not being, you know, the concept of danger. And I know in Natalia, the biggest thing was she used to bang her head a lot. Mm-hmm. It would just be so hard because it's like, well, we're going to have to put a helmet. Thankfully, she stopped. It didn't get to that level, but that was also difficult too. Yeah. Well, I have three kids that are autistic and my, my two youngest, I don't think we ever really experienced that like self-injurious type stuff. My oldest did a lot of self-injury, a lot of self-injury. And that was really tough to deal with because it, it's hard to manage. Cause I don't know how you, you can't really stop them all the time. And there's nobody, like nobody gives you, at least in, in my situation, like we didn't have, there wasn't a whole lot of guidance to kind of help us navigate that kind of thing? Like, what, what are you supposed to do? Like, how do you handle that? Do you, uh, did you ever get the comments from people that would be like, well, they're not going to do it so hard that they hurt themselves. Do you know what I mean? Well, anytime that I had mentioned that they hit themselves, you know, uh, self harm and things like that, there wasn't really too much feedback about it. Um, more so cause, and, and I forgot to mention that Natalia has something called pica. Okay. She yeah. ingests things that are not edible, like paper, pencil, plastic, anything. And so we actually had an incident 
at one of her schools where um, she was left unattended for a while or else I'm sure someone would have noticed that she ate wood chips from the playground. And I had no idea what happened because she came home. All of a sudden, she got really pale and sick. And I said, maybe she had the flu. She started picking all this brown chunky stuff. And I'm like, what do I do? I went to the emergency room and they were like, it's wood chips. And I went and confronted the school right away. I said, what is going on? Why was my child left unattended for so long to the point where she ingested so many wood chips? We're very lucky that nothing was internally injured Mm -hmm. for her. And so that's another difficulty with Natalia. She needs 24-7 total care because of the whole pica thing. Now, with the girls being twins, do they present the same way or do they present differently? Does that make sense? They both present different parts of the spectrum. They both have noise sensitivity, but one is more sensitive than the other, Aaliyah. She doesn't like bells. She has a complete meltdown. You know, she starts screaming and crying. Natalia, not not so. She, the sounds really don't bother her too much, unless it's a loud noise. Hers, you know, hers is like she sees a bird. She she does not like birds. She'll go ahead and duck. She thinks the bird's gonna land on her, and she's like completely fearful of bird. Versus Natalia, Aaliyah, she's not scared of birds, but she is scared of bugs, even down to a fly. So she will just sit there and freeze. And so they do have their different things. Um, they both have ADHD, and so. They have their similarities too, but for the most part, the really the only big difference is Natalia has the pica. We've dealt with that in the past, and there have been emergency room visits or giant wads of paper. You know, that that's one of those challenges that like A, nobody talks about. And it is, I think, fairly common in autistic kids, but but nobody ever talks about that. And so like I, when we were dealing with that, it was like this sort of taboo thing, like nobody knew anything about it or whatever. And it, it's um, I don't know. It's a, it's a difficult thing to try and manage. And I, and, and I guess that's what I was trying to say is people don't understand the challenge with that because it's literally anything and, and you have to be vigilant in order to prevent that kind of stuff from happening. How has the journey been for you? Like, how did you deal with the girls being diagnosed? Like, what was that like for you? That was very difficult, especially that both were diagnosed on the spectrum. Actually, it was a little harder for my, um, for their father accept than really for me, for myself um and the reason being that i guess well autism runs in my family i do have an older niece that was diagnosed with autism so i did have a little bit of a somewhat of an experience of what to expect when the girls were diagnosed but you know it's a lot goes through your head you're like you know are they ever going to be potty trained are they ever going to talk are they you know ever going to be independent or are they going to have to rely on someone to do everything for them all the time? So many things go through your head. It's like, what are they going to do when I'm not around anymore? You know, that I'm six feet under the ground or, you know, who I have to make sure everything's all taken care of. It's a lot of uh, worry and anxiety as to what's going to happen. You know, some people are lucky that they, you know, their child progresses other families experience a little bit more difficulties in navigating. Um, I call it a different operating system, mm-hmm. you know, and, and it, you have to be ready to, you know, depending on what buttons are being pressed and what's coming at you and how to, you know, I guess, roll it, dodge it or get through it. Did you find that you had, did like the people in your life understand? Cause I, I know a lot of parents in my experience was, was similar where it's tough to get the people around you, especially, you know, 13 years ago when it was less common, did the people in your life understand? Was it difficult to explain to them? Did you find that like support or finding support and services? Was that a, was that a challenge? At at the time? No. And even now I've been very lucky and blessed that I have not experienced like any really difficulties in obtaining services for them. Um, You know, they, we've had therapists come to the house and they've gone to therapies as well. And so, um, you had mentioned a little bit ago that you were caught off guard a little bit by the idea that there's like a delay for the diagnosis process. And it's really interesting because like, it, it really depends, I think, on where you live, you know, uh, that it sort of impacts the, the ability to find services. Cause I've, I've talked to parents who are on, especially in the advent of COVID 18 month wait lists to get diagnosed, you know, and, and services don't open up until the diagnosis takes place. It seems like there are more like negative stories about that than there are positive ones. And it's good to hear that there's 
places out there that that the system works and it's and it's doing what it's supposed to do and it's a timely process. Um, what's life like right now? You know, as they're older. Now that they're older, I have to go back and far as get them into more therapy. Um, with the whole COVID thing, they really become really like Aaliyah more so more of a homebody that I'm having a difficult time transitioning them out to go out. So I do have to seek out, um, you know, therapies and helping, you know, them to overcome that. I had that difficulty, like when we first moved here and then I had services where, um, their therapist, her name was Miss Tamiko. She would help me, um, you know, take them out in public and things like that because having both autistic children out, you know, and, and, you know, having an extra pair of hands does help. So uh, we were able to do that and the girls progressed. They, you know, we're able to, you know, like I would say, hey, let's go to the pool and they would get their stuff and then they would go, you know, and now they're, you know, a little bit actually more sociable. The other day, Natalia and I went to a public pool in South Plainfield. That's her favorite one. And all on her own, she, she was very sociable, saying hello to everybody in the pool. So that was just really nice progress that uh, I was able to enjoy and see all the hard work, all the tears, all the screaming, all the biting, all the kicking, as those are the moments that us parents, that's what we live for. This episode of the Autism Dead podcast is brought to you by Trail Magic. Communing with nature is one of the best methods of self-care available, and hiking is one of the best ways to enjoy nature. If you're a parent who enjoys hitting the trails with your little ones, you're already aware that toddlers will walk some of the journey and want to be carried the rest of the way. There are tons of contraptions out there for carrying babies while on a trail, but what about those in-between toddler years? You don't want to bring a big, bulky carrier for a kid who's only going to use it some of the time. The Trail Magic Kid Carrier solves that problem, and it does so brilliantly. Invented by a dad who wanted to take his three-year-old backpacking, it's for kiddos 12 months up to 43 pounds. The carrier attaches onto hiking backpacks and durable day packs that have a waist strap and upper loaders. Weighing less than 10 ounces, it's so portable you can stuff it in the side of your backpack when not in use. The Trail Magic Kid Carrier is a total game changer for the outdoor adventure family community. For more information, visit trailmagic.com. That's T-R-A-I-L-M-A-G-I-K.com. Use the code the autism dad at checkout and save 10% off your order. Has this journey of parenting your girls, has that impacted you in any way? Has it caused you to see life in a different way, if that makes sense? Yes, um, it definitely makes me see life in a different way because people with special needs or autism, it's, it's just, you know, the world's just not as understanding. The world is just not as kind, you know, and, and being on this side of the end, you learn to be empathetic and, and nice and help out whenever you see someone struggling, you know, instead of just watching them struggle and just leave them there, you know, you just don't know what the, you know, what the situation is. So it's taught me to be more compassionate and more empathetic. And then its journey has also, you know, fueled me to educate people more about it because a lot of people don't know unless you're really walking in the shoes of a special needs parent. And so if I can just share those things from my experience and my journey with them, so that way we can make our world just a little bit better because it just really, you know, breaks my heart when I hear these other stories, you know, or when I see, you know, not in, in just happening happening right in front of you, you know? And so those are the, some of the things that I just, you know, walk away from it, just the viewing, just viewing it like as a different operating system. And then what I love most is that, you know, with autism, they don't have a care in the world. They don't even care if someone's even making fun of them. So I think that's just one of the best parts that walk away. You just learn, you know, it's like, I wish I could be like them, like, you know, but you, I'm the one that hears all the snickering and the bickering. And then I'm the one that, you know, thank you. <laughs> my mouth quiet and I have to address the person appropriately. And yeah. so, but that's Been why I'm, I'm, I'm here to be their protector, their caregiver, not only for them, but for anybody, I will step in for anybody that I see anything, you know, it not just going on or if they're struggling, you know, and hopefully setting the example for, for the world, like do the same, you know, infuse, infuse our world with positivity. You know, you hear so many other things about it. Hopefully I bring just a little bit of light to it. What would you say is the most challenging part of your journey currently as of uh, today? What's, what's the hardest part for you to kind of manage everything now? 
I guess that is the hard part of just, I guess, uh, managing everything between the therapies or not one, but two. I mean, you already know because you have three. So, you know, and dealing with those things and making sure you're just on top of everything, not only for them, for them, but also for yourself. And so it's a really difficult task in juggling all that. Usually I'm pretty juggling. You know, I'll juggle, but then once in a blue, it's like everything just falls apart. And it's just one of those days like, okay, I'm just going to have to reset and keep going however many times so I could finish this day out. And so that's a good attitude. You know, it's hard to have a positive attitude with all the other things. But then what does that really do? If you could turn it around and make it positive and put that positivity back in our world because it's def- our world definitely needs it. What would you say is one thing that you would like to see change in the world to make life easier for families like ours and kids like ours? Well, family like ours and kids like ours, and I know we're all on this page of facing the same dilemma. What happens with our kids after they graduate from high school? What do we do afterwards, you know, as far as where are they going to go to school? Are they going to go to a specialized, you know, institution now or specialized college? There are some adult programs that help them transition, you know, learn about money, go shopping, prepare them to go in the community for work. You know, they have other places where they work with, for example, Edison High School, they have like a supermarket called ShopRite in there. So that way they were able to teach our special needs kids how to go shopping in a grocery store. And you have a list and get the things on the list. And then, you know, you take the money and that's, you know, you just make sure you have enough to cover your expenses and things like that. But then, The question is, what happens after that? You know, I just really hope that more people can step up and provide these opportunities for our families and kids, especially our 18 and over section of our special needs autism sector, parents and kids. Have you heard of a place called Lifetown? Yes. It's in um, in Jersey. They have all different like... um, like doctor's office or yeah. pharmacy, something like they, that, they, right? They were on the podcast a couple of year, couple of seasons back. It's, uh, I think it's Rabbi Zalman uh, who runs it. I think it's associated with the, the Friendship Circle, but it's like this 55,000 square foot facility. I don't know why I'm stretching my arms out. Like that's how big it is. But <laughs> <laughs> it's this huge building and they have all of these storefronts and stuff like that. So like the kids can practice uh, like going to the dentist or going to the bank or going to a store and buying groceries. Or I think they have like socialization kind of stuff, but it's uh like, it's a real life experience because they have people who come in and, and manage the bank and they have people who come in and manage like the storefronts and stuff like that. So they kids or young adults can get that like firsthand experience. They do stuff for like job interviewing and, and just practicing with everyday life things. And it's in Jersey. I don't know exactly where it is, but all the good things related to autism, all the, the big things like that are, are in Jersey. Jersey's like the epicenter of where you want to be if you have autistic kids. Um, uh, go ahead. Yes, they've said that Jersey is one of the top three states to raise a family yeah. with autism. Um, I've heard many other families and other teachers that have gone to other states and they've said that services are not the same, which is a shame because there should be some consistency across the board for all of us, you know. You think, yeah. And then you were to think, but then you hear all these things, it's like, what? You know, what is really going on? You know, who will stand up, hold accountability and hold whoever we need to, to get that for us. When I first started out, when, when Gavin was first diagnosed back in 2005, there was, Ruby, go lay down. Lay down. Dog. Go on. Go on. Lay down. She's so needy. Um, when Gavin was first diagnosed back in 2005, it was so uncommon. There was nothing. It seemed like there were no services that were available. There was, I didn't even know anybody else who had a kid diagnosed with autism, it feels like we've really come a long way. Sometimes it doesn't seem that way because we run into these obstacles where, you know, services aren't available or people are, you know, not very accepting or understanding or kind or whatever. But for me, if I can stop and and look at where I'm at now versus where we were back in 2005, we made a lot of progress. We still have a lot of progress we need to make. You know, I think by like sharing your story and every other parent that's willing to to share their story, I think it helps to educate and kind of put a face to it so that we can better coexist and get along and find ways to support each other. And it's important that we have different families talking about their experiences because none of them are going to be the same. Everything's going to be just a little bit different, at least in some way or significantly different. And so just because your kids are diagnosed with autism doesn't mean that your experience is the same as mine with my kids who were diagnosed with autism. We, We all have these unique challenges and we face these, uh, these different things. And, and I think that it's very difficult to 
really convey that to people and they, they kind of treat it like it's a one size fits all thing and it just doesn't doesn't work that way. Right. So, so a lot of things that we have to navigate through and maneuver than, you know, regular parents, things like that. You also have your own business, right? I do. I have created my own business because okay. I had to create an opportunity for myself. Finding an employee that's understanding about my attendance is very difficult. So I decided to um, open my business. The name of my business is Costeña Crafts LLC. Mm-hmm. I am on Facebook. And so I do custom gifts, custom diaper cakes. I make jewelry, custom t-shirts and things like that. And um, right now it's a, it's a baby. It's just being born my company. And so I do have really big hopes for it. And, and my ultimate dream is that I'm able to employ special needs, adults, parents, caregivers, and give them the opportunity of employment and give them a place where they're able to come to work and know that, you know, your job is secure. You're not going to lose your job because of your attendance, because you have to attend to your child that has special medical needs, you know, and it's mm-hmm. not like, you, these are medically necessary things that we have an obligation to. And if I can provide an environment, a, you know, a, an assuring environment, knowing they, at the end of the day, they're not going to lose their job because they have their responsibility with their, with their child mm-hmm. um, being, you know, m- with any medical difficulties or issues that they may have. Like outside of their control. That's, that's really right. cool. That's really cool because, and, and I think that's what we need. We need to see more of, of that, you know, you get people like yourself who, who know what it's like. And despite all of the challenges that you have in your life, you are trying to build something that will help other people to be able to maintain employment or hire people with developmental disabilities. Uh, I don't know. It's like 1230 right now. And at two o'clock, I have a meeting in North Canton at a, at a business that employs people with developmental disabilities. It's like a, it's like a coffee shop. It's a really cool uh, idea that they're doing. And it's nice to, it's nice to see that. I think that's a, that's a positive thing. And I do know that you also make it a point to try and promote other small businesses who are trying to get off the ground and, and get noticed. What sort of drives you to do all that? What drives me to do about is I know what it is to struggle as a business owner and entrepreneur and trying to get yourself out there, you know, and there's a lot of, programs and people that offer to, Hey, if you pay me 150 bucks, I'll promote you here and there. And mm-hmm. it's like, um, that, you know, advertising is one actually, um, expense that you can, it's a tax write off <laughs> for your business. And so, um, I like to just do it to, cause I know, I know the struggle. So I just want to be helpful and get everyone else out there, you know, seen and, you know, maybe it's that, it's that one you know, like, or that one follow that will help them grow in the hopes that in return, they will help me grow too. So it's a give or take. And then pay it forward. Exactly. And pay it forward. Um, We're all trying to make it, we're all in the same boat. You know, we're all trying to accomplish the same thing. And so if we can help each other do that, and if I can be part of that process, because it's not only do I promote locally, but I promote all over the United States and Puerto Rico. And so, um, and it's a variety of services, whether it's musicians that come out with new albums, doctors, lawyers, products for beauty and health, anything as far as you, you know, you'd want me to promote it, just inbox me and I'll be more than happy to do that. All right. We'll have all those links in the show notes so people can uh, connect with you and set something up if they're interested in doing that. Um, Two questions. One, for anybody out there and even myself sitting here wondering, like, how do you manage to do all of this? How do you keep your head above water? you know, even emotionally and physically too. Like, how do you keep going? Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I think other parents who are were, who were living this life, like understand what I mean, because like there's days where you were just so buried that you don't know if you can just get up and keep moving. And I was just wondering how you do everything that you're doing. Well, Rob, it's, it's not easy and I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It is not a easy task to do it all. It's very hard to keep your own head above water. Self-care is one of the biggest things for me to keep up with because most times it's more guilt like oh i can't put myself first i have to put everybody else first right. but as they say you have to put your oxygen mask on first and how do i do it a lot of people are like i don't know how you do it as a single mom you know you work and you know you have amazon you have your business and you have all these things and it's just when you're left with no choice you just have to just you just do it because who else is going to do it for you who else is going to come in you know do you really want someone from the state or, you know, someone, a complete stranger doing all that. So and just push yourself, you know, it's not easy. A lot of, you know, coffee, (laughs) 
a less Celsius drink, energy drink. And so, but then, you know, I've also learned that sometimes you just need a break and it's okay, you know, to put yourself in a timeout sometimes to get yourself together and, and trying to, you know, get you back into juggling and everything between therapies and everything else. But it's not easy. Let me ask you this too, because it occurred to me as you were, as you were saying that you probably are so used to what you're doing that it just feels normal. Right. And I say that because like in my life, if, if you were to take somebody and just drop them into my life and give me the day off, they'd probably lose their mind. Right. Because it's just, you know, it's a difficult thing sometimes, but I'm so used to it that when people say things like, Oh my gosh, I don't know how you do it or how, Oh my God, you, like whatever. It's like, I just like, I don't, I don't recognize what I'm doing as being anything more than what like any other dad would do or any other parent would do. I don't always recognize the challenges that I'm dealing with because I just so kind of accustomed to it being that way. And one of the things that really uh, concerned me, and, and I really like what you had to say about self-care, is that we get so stressed out and we get so used to that level of stress that we don't notice how stressed out we are. And we can't sustain that for very long. And so, like you said, self-care is so important. Taking time out for yourself and doing so without feeling guilty, which is easier said than done. I get it. But you fail, everyone fails, right? So you gotta, you gotta. And failing's okay because you're just learning. Yeah. Failure doesn't mean, you know, you just, that's it. It's done. It's, it's a learning opportunity. It's always learning, um, taking away from your mistakes and what not to do and what to do. You have to, because, you know, your energy, especially around the, your kids, you know, they pick up on that. And I know yeah. for sure my daughter too, because once I start, you know, I'm like my mom ran and then they're, you know, and I could tell they start escalating too. And it's like, okay, I'm just, you know. It's like a symbiotic, like my kids right. live like in symbiosis with me. So like, I may not say like, Hey guys, I'm really stressed out today, but they can like pick up on that vibe. And it yeah. just sort of like, it's amplified for them. And it just kind of creates uh turmoil in their lives. You know, I had a therapist tell me once you have to be selfish before you can be selfless. You have to be able to function in order to be the parent that your kids need you to be. And the only way you can do that long-term is if you are taking time to put back into yourself. And so that's, that's a really good point that you made. I really appreciate that. And I, I hope you guys listen to that because self-care is so important. I harp on it all the time. It really is. It truly is. You do have to be selfish in order to do what we need to do, you know, and it's not the normal things that every parent does. You know, we have a different degree and level that we have to meet and, you know, we just don't have any other option. We have to do what we have to do. So it's really important to take care of ourselves in the process. Do you have any advice or guidance to parents out there who are on that same journey? Like just something that maybe you learned along the way that, that might just help another family out there? As far as learning on the way, the beginning part of my journey for any other parents that are in the beginning of their journey or their concern about, you know, their child might have autism or they might not, you know, I always say, you know, go ahead and get them evaluated. I know some people experience the difficulties of wait lists. If there's a wait list, try to find something else, make a phone call, keep calling until you find an appointment, keep calling until you find that one person that gives you what you need and what you're looking for. You know, I mean, what's the worst they can tell you? No, they don't have autism, but you know, these are the things that they need to be worked on. You know, when you get this diagnosis, don't think it's the end because the possibilities are really endless. What's most important is getting the help that they need the earliest that you can for them. Yeah, it's just a diagnosis for papers, you know, and it's always focusing on what they can do and helping them practice and, and train on the things that they still need to work on and just continue with it. You know, it's, it's very, it's, it's a difficult journey, but you know, you have to also maintain positive and, and just keep looking forward. Don't look back, you know, and get us a good support group, reach out to someone that you can actually vent to and talk to that's trustworthy just because you talk to a therapist or you're in therapy doesn't mean you're crazy or, you know, you're sick or, you know, anything else. It's actually really helpful. Yeah. Very good advice. That's really, really good. I would do all of that. How are you guys listening? Do all of that. Thank you for sharing everything and uh, for working through some Thanks, of Thanks, Rob, for the invite. Oh, you're welcome. We had to work through some technical difficulties, but we're patient. That's one of the other things that my kids have taught me, patience. We are, we are nothing if not patient anymore. So thank you again and have a great week. Thanks you too, Rob. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. I hope in 
the midst of me sharing my experiences and my story as uh, light and hope for someone else of not giving up and still continuing to do what they need to do, not only for themselves, but for their kids and their family. Thank you for setting a good example. Thanks, Rob. Take care. All right. You too. Bye. Before I close things out today, I just want to say thank you to Jacqueline for taking the time to come on the show and sharing so openly about her life and her kids and what their journey has been like and the struggles and the triumphs and and all of that kind of stuff. It's really, really important that we pay attention to each other's stories, guys, because everyone is different. Every autistic person is different. Every journey is different. And when we fail to recognize that, we're invalidating what other people are going through and, and we don't want to do that. All of Jacqueline's information will be in the show notes below so you guys can check out her business and her website and social media stuff. Uh, Thank you again, Jacqueline. I really appreciate you uh, sharing your story. As for me, you can find me at listen.theautismdad.com where you can check out everything related to this podcast all in one place. You can leave feedback and comments and suggestions and apply to be a guest yourself. You can check out my sponsors. Please check out my sponsors. I really appreciate that. And uh, you can subscribe and do whatever you want. So uh, very proud of it. Brand new. Listen.theautismdad.com. Thank you guys so much for taking the time to tune in. I will talk to you next Monday. Have a great week.